Good morning. I'm glad to be with you this morning. Um, I just want to open and talk about how delighted I am to be here uh, this morning uh, and express how honored I am to be here and asked to preach. First and foremost, I want to point out how blessed we are that we can even assemble today. And uh, I am grateful for the members of this body. Uh, this body is full of the love of God. Not merely just a collection of people that share the same political ideas and common interests, but a church built on the rock of Christ and strongly desire to be his bride. I'm very grateful. I'm here today to teach you from a passage from the book of Numbers, uh, chapter 16. And you may ask, why would you want to teach from Numbers 16? My answer is, as a new believer reading this chapter for the first time, I found it to be extremely intriguing. And over the years, I noticed God would bring this specific passage back to the forefront of my memory over and over and over again. This passage deals with many special and common themes. Uh, one of the most important is rebellion, which is such a dirty word today, such an ugly connotation. We don't like to hear it. But if we have a correct understanding of sacred scripture, we have to understand that we are indeed rebels. We cannot get past chapter 3 of Genesis without realizing how mankind is constantly opposing or flat out disobeying God's authority. First John says, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. So look, either God is a liar because he tells us in his word for all of sin falling short of the glory of God or we are sinners. There's really no other option. How many of us have attended some kind of theology class, either truth or life, something along the lines of that? Well, from these classes, hopefully you remember that God is immutable, which means that he cannot change his character, thus he cannot lie. Since he cannot lie, we are indeed sinners. Our passage today is usually a tougher passage to understand because it needs some context and background knowledge. Often we try to explain away passages like these because somewhere in our hearts we find it difficult to accept God as being loving father, righteous judge, and fountain of eternal truth. Sometimes us as Christians sinfully oversimplify passages such as these to make God on the left-hand side of the Bible seem less gracious and less loving as God on the right-hand side of the Bible to fit our own personal understanding of morality. It is my prayer that we can go through this passage together with open minds and open hearts. So if you could please stand with me for the reading of God's word in the chapter from uh, number 16, chapter 16. Oh, chapter, yeah, number 16, sorry. This is the word of God and it is eternally true. Now Korah, the son of Izar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, on the sons of Peluf, the sons of Reuben took action. And they rose up before Moses, together with some of the sons of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, chosen in the assembly, men of renown. They assembled together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You have gone far enough, for all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? When Moses heard this, he fell on his face, and he spoke to Korah and his company, saying, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy, and he will bring him near to himself. Even the one whom he will choose, he will bring near to himself. Do this, take censers for yourselves, Korah and all your company, and put fire in them. Lay incense upon them in the presence of the Lord tomorrow. And the man whom the Lord 
shall choose be the, and the man whom the Lord chooses shall be the one who is holy. You have gone far enough, sons of Levi. Then Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi, is it not enough for you that God, the God of Israel has separated you from the rest of the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord, to stand before the congregation and minister to them? And that he has brought you near, Korah, you and all your brothers, sons of Levi, with you. And you are seeking the priesthood also? Therefore, you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. But as for Aaron, who are you to grumble against him? Then Moses sent summons to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and they said, We will not come up. Is it not enough that you have brought us out of a land flowing with milk and honey to have us die in the wilderness, but you would also lord over us? Indeed, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor have you given us an inheritance of the fields and vineyards. Would you put out the eyes of these men? We would not come up. Then Moses became very angry and said to the Lord, Do not regard their offering. I have not taken a single donkey from them, nor have done any harm to them. Moses said to Korah, You and all your company be present before the Lord tomorrow, both you along with Aaron. Each of you take his fire pan and put incense on it, and each of you bring his censer before the Lord. 250 fire pans. Also you and Aaron shall bring his fire pan. So they took each so they each took his own censer and put fire on it and laid incense on it and they stood at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Thus Korah assembled all the congregation against them in the doorway of the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them instantly. But they fell on their faces. O oh God, God of the spirits and all flesh, when one man sins, will you be angry with the entire congregation? Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the congregation, saying, Get back from around the dwellings of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Then Moses arose and went to Dathan and Abiram with the elders of Israel following him, and spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart now from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing that belongs to them, or you will be swept away in their sin. So they got back from around the dwellings of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the doorway of their tents, along with their wives and their sons and their little ones. Moses said this, By this you will know that the Lord has sent me to do these deeds, for this is not my doing. If these men die the death of all men, or if they suffer the fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord brings about an entirely new thing and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that is theirs, and they descend alive into Sheol, Sheol then you will understand that these men have spurned the Lord. As he finished speaking these words, the ground that was under, under them split open. The earth opened his mouth and swallowed them up and all their possessions and all the men that belonged to Korah and their possessions. So they, so they and all that belonged to them went down alive to Sheol and the earth closed over them and they perished from the midst of the assembly. All Israel who were around them fled at their outcry for they said the earth may swallow us up. Fire also came forth from the Lord and consumed 200 and the 250 men who were offering the incense. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are great and you are mighty. Thank you for allowing us to assemble before you today. Father, we praise you for the churches you have given us. Thank you for this body. And I ask that you bless their endeavors. Father, I'm grateful for the fellowship among believers here and for our leaders that fear you above all things. I ask you that you allow your truth to be preached today. I pray that you would convict minds and soften hearts. I pray that you give my words power. In Jesus' name, amen. Going back to the beginning of our passage, you see some names listed. Korah, Izar, Kohath, 
and Levi. The first key fact we are introduced about the man named Korah is that he is a son of Levi. If we read Exodus chapter 6, we see a genealogy. Just to make things clear, in our personal study of scripture, we are never to skip these chapters with genealogies. This is why they are so important. To make this easy for you, I sent a chart to the projection team uh, to make this more simple. Um, Jacob's son, Levi, Jacob's son, Levi, had three sons, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. The middle son of Levi, Kohath, had four sons, Amram, Izhar, Hebron, and Uziel. The first son of Kohath, Amram, is the father of Moses and Aaron, and the second son of Kohath is our father, Korah. All these men are descendant of, descendants of Levi, making them all Levites, as you can see. We see from our, par our passage that Korah had gathered together 250 prominent men to challenge Moses' authority. Let's take a look at Korah's complaint in verse 3, where he says, You have gone far enough, for all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is in their midst. Why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Korah is basically accusing Moses and Aaron of putting themselves in a position that is only reserved for the Lord. You may say, well, aren't Korah's claims somewhat justified him being a Levite? And I would agree with the fact that Korah is indeed a Levite and God did set apart the Levites to serve as priests. But the problem with this is that God gave his people very specific rules for how exactly they were supposed to complete their work as priests. To answer this question fully, I first need to give some background knowledge on the book of Numbers. Chapter 3 through 8 deal specifically with the role of a Levite. The Lord even gives Aaron his benediction in chapter 6. What they are to do, how are they to carry themselves, how they are to complete their tasks. This refers to how they handle the equipment belonging to the tent of meeting, how to complete certain offerings, settle civil disputes, accomplish the worship service. If you have your Bible, stick your finger in this chapter because we'll come back to it, but turn to chapter 4 of Numbers. In chapter 4, verses 4 through 20, the Lord meticulously lists all the things that Aaron and his sons are to do regarding the holy objects and the tent of meeting when they are to be picked up and moved. Remember that the sons of Israel are nomadic people at this time being in the wilderness. The Lord even commands them in what material they are supposed to cover and wrap each item in. Then the Lord very specifically explains to the Kohathites concerning the tent of meeting. Note that both Moses, Aaron, and Korah are Kohathites because they share him as a common grandfather being cousins. We can understand that the Lord is specifically talking about Aaron and his sons because verse 5 says, When the camp sets out, Aaron and his sons shall go in and they shall take down the veil of the screen and cover the ark of testimony with it. And the Lord continues to use the word they 15 times, I count it, with no other indication of whom else he is referring to until chapter 15, where he said, uh, verse 15, where he says, when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the holy objects and all the furnishings of the sanctuary, when the camp is to set out, after the sons of Kohath shall come and carry them. So they will not touch the holy objects and die. And continues in verse 19 saying, but do this to them that they may live and not die when they approach the most holy objects. Aaron and his sons shall go in and assign each of them a work to his load. And they shall not go and see the holy objects even for a moment or they will die. The Lord makes it very clear that the Kohathites are to carry the holy objects and the furniture of the tabernacle only only after Aaron and his sons have covered it properly. If the Kohathites touched, verse 15, or even saw, verse 20, the holy objects prior to Aaron and his sons completing their work, they were to die. 
So the argument of Korah and his fellow rebels is critically misinformed. Because Moses and Aaron are not acting in a way of self-exaltation, but they are conducting themselves in a way to be carefully obedient to what God has said. Unfortunately, even though Korah is a Levite, set apart in some ways, maybe even practicing his religion perfectly, perfectly, his argument is completely rooted in rebellion against God. Thus, why this chapter is commonly called Korah's Rebellion because he's the leader and he's clearly rebelling against God. He is coming from a place where God has specifically commanded his people to worship him in one way, and Korah thinks that he can in fact worship him in his own way apart from what God has said. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 28 says, be careful to listen to all the words which I command you so that it will be well with you and your sons forever, for you will be doing what is good and right in the sight of the Lord. I can go on and on, but it's very clear that the Lord has declared for his people to carefully, carefully obey all that he has commanded. In fact, Korah's accusations about Moses and Aaron are untrue, and our attempt to steal power from Moses. I find it interesting, to say the least, that the very thing that Korah is accusing Moses and Aaron of, he is the one that, that is actually doing it. This is a dictionary definition of the word irony. And a stern reminder for us to remove the plank from our very own eye. Now Moses is most certainly not sinless, but you would be making a very reputable argument if you were to define Moses' character as anything other than a righteous man with great faith. Not only righteous, but he was humble and truly cared for the spiritual and physical needs of Israel. Anything else would be a falsification. I think it's important for us to learn from this major flaw of Korah and understand that it was recorded through 3,000 years of history so that we would not replicate it. Unfortunately, this is a pivotal problem in our society today. God has said one thing and we think it's more loving and acceptable when we do another. And this cannot stand because we serve a God that will not share his glory and commands our complete obedience to his word. And we as believers in Christ need to better recognize and combat, combat disobedience towards God. Saints, remember that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers. Satan is the father of discouragement, the leader of disappointment, the emperor of empty promises, the ruler of all rebellion against God, and the king of all liars. To combat the sin of Korah, we have to believe and understand this. Satan will always promise you with more power than what is possible for him to give because he's simply a liar and a coward. These words are synonymous. All cowards lie and all uh, liars are cowardly. Look at Matthew chapter 4 where Jesus goes out to be tempted in the wilderness. Again, the devil took him on a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said to him, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. There's absolutely nothing in the Bible that indicates that Satan has the authority to give kingdoms or glory away. This is because they are not his to give away. We hold firm to the belief that Satan is a created being and is in no way capable of doing anything remotely close to this. So thus we can conclude that he is lying. If Satan would try these things on Jesus, the son of God, of course Satan would attempt to whisper into our lives, into our families, into our communities, into our college groups, into our universities, into our governments, and into our societies. According to the scriptures, he would do and say anything to get people to turn away from what God has deemed to be holy and right. If you don't believe me, look at some examples. God demands us to continuously, continuously teach our children about his word. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Satan whispers that it should be illegal for us to even mention God in schools, and we need more separation between church and state. 
God says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy, Exodus 20. Satan whispers that many manufacturing plants remain open on Sundays. Well, because profits. They might even offer you double time to work on this day. God created the male and female in his own image. Satan whispers in our society that if you were born a male and you really, really, really want to be a female, do it if you feel that way. God commands that we give generously, generously to the le- to less fortunate. Satan whispers, well, he looks like he might buy drugs with it. And besides, he can get a job everybody's hiring. I can go on and on, but the fact of the matter is that we must base our understanding of what we should be pursuing in life based on what God has said. This statement is countercultural. Truth is, saints, that the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. He is a coward and a liar. Now imagine walking down the street with $100,000 in your pocket and some young punk jumps from behind a corner and demands your money. Got a little switchblade or whatever. You would do anything, anything, punch, kick, scream, run, resist, to keep him away from what you find to be precious. Right? Why don't we see our holiness and our purity the same way? Satan may have whispered into Korah's ear, but Korah did not resist. He was filled with the desire to further his own kingdom. Let's continue with our main passage. When Moses hears their complaints, he falls on his face, verse 5. And there is some significance to this. First, first, this is not the first time Moses has done this. He does it earlier in Numbers 14 when the people were rebelled. Secondly, it's almost as if that he knows any rebellion against him or against Aaron's priesthood is not merely a rebellion against him himself, but against the Lord God, Yahweh. Thoroughly understanding that this is an issue of God's authority, he goes directly before God and lets him decide whom he has chosen. Instead of pounding his chest to try to prove his authority, With his own power, Moses decides to move out of the way and let God show who is his. In a way that God, only God can, so there can be no question. We serve a God that hates wickedness, loves justice, and laughs at our plans. Now Moses, knowing and understanding the character of God, decides to let God be judged. A godly shepherd must first Trust and rely on God when engaging in conflict. Because without faith, this is truly an unwinnable battle. Many of the righteous conflicts that I, I in our life would be completely avoided if I were to first analyze if God is even honored by me engaging in that particular problem. But just because Moses turns to God first does not mean that he does not respond at all. Soon after he issues somewhat of a challenge, and also a firm rebuke to the rebels. In verses 4 through 7, he describes the challenge by commanding them, the rebels, to take their fire pans and lay incense as an offering before God. When I say challenge, what I mean is uh, laying incense on burning coals the way to do an offering before God. This was supposed to be done by God's priests, but the leaders of this rebellion felt as if they had the same rights as the priests If God had not, even though God had not chosen or decreed anything pertaining to this, Moses wanted to let God show them their foolishness. Moses issues a rebuke to them in verse 8 saying, Hear now, you sons of Levi, for is it not enough that God, the God of Israel, has separated you from the rest of the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord, to stand before the congregation and minister to them? Moses basically explains to them the fact that the Levites are set apart, and that should be enough. He confronts them with the fact that they are gathered together against the Lord, not against Aaron or himself. In verse 12 of our chapter, Dathan and Abiram indicate that they would have rather been in Egypt than to be in the wilderness. You can see this because they referred to Egypt as a land flowing with milk and honey. 
in contrast to the wilderness being a place where they are just to die. How quick they were to forget how the people of Israel were greatly afflicted in the slavery that they were under in Egypt. And how God saved them from the tyranny of Pharaoh. Also, how quick are we to grumble when God removes us from the slavery of our sin? We are just, just like them in some ways. Not only do they express their disapproval for leaving Egypt, but they decide to attack, to attack Moses' leadership from a distance, saying that Moses has lorded over them. Now this angers Moses, and he finally, finally defends himself. Note how long it takes for Moses to defend himself. When I am in any conflict, the first thing out of my mouth is how the person accusing me is wrong. We all do this, and it exposes our true motivations. Being made, us being made to appear faultless rather than God being glorified. But Moses does not let his anger paralyze him and continues with the challenge at hand concerning the fire pans and incense. Verse 19, thus Korah assembled all the congregation against them at the doorway of the tent of meeting. I just want you to notice how swiftly, swiftly this rebellion has grown. It started with 250 prominent men, men of renown. It's cancerous. At this point in time, Korah was able to assemble the entire congregation against Moses and Aaron. Be on the alert when following what is popular or the it crowd. Korah was able to lead the entire congregation of Israel in a rebellion against the Lord. And God desired to punish them in the same way that Korah would be punished. But Moses, the faithful shepherd, intervened and pleaded with God for the sake of his flock. He and Aaron fell on their faces. This is so important. This is so important. As any parent, as any husband, as any employer, as any youth leader, as any Bible leader, period, as any leader in general, this verse should light a fire, a fire under our behinds. Why? Because we don't do this. Not the way that we should. We are complainers. As soon as someone under us does something wrong, we just complain and blame God. We do not take into account that we don't spend enough time on our faces in prayer on their behalf. A godly shepherd prays for God to be merciful on the behalf of the sinners in his flock. Not only do we do this corporately every single Sunday, but I have some examples in scripture. Look at Job chapter 1. It mentions that Job was a blameless, upright, fearing, upright man, fearing God and turning away evil. In the beginning of the chapter, it lists all the possessions that God had given him, including seven sons and three daughters. He was so wealthy that his seven sons would hold a feast for every day of the week. But look at what verse 5 says. When the days of feasting had completed their cycle, Job would sin and consecrate them, rising up early in the morning and offering up burnt offerings according to the number of all of them. For Job said, perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continuously. Job, a God-fearing man, continuously prayed for his sons just in case, just in case, that they sinned against God. We must continuously pray for our children, our coworkers, our friends, especially if they do not know Jesus nor love his bride, the church. In the book of Ezra, the children of Israel are returning back to Israel from living under the Babylonians in, cap in captivity. Ezra sets off before them as their leader to go and rebuild the temple of God in Jerusalem. The Bible says Ezra was skilled in the law of Moses and the hand of God was upon him. But in Ezra chapter 9, Ezra is informed that some of the men of Israel, including some of the priests, had taken foreign wives from the nations around them. What's the problem with this? Well, God specifically commanded them that they were not to do this. 
Deuteronomy chapter 7. This command was to keep Israel from the idolatry and the, and the wickedness of the people of the nations around them. Ezra finds out that his people that he are leading has done this, and he tears his robe. And he tears the, head, the hair from his head and says, Oh my God, I am ashamed and embarrassed to lift up my face to you. My God, for our iniquities have risen above our heads and our guilt has grown even to the heavens. And he later says in verse 15, O oh God, God of Israel, you are righteous, for we have been left an escape remnant as it is this day. Behold, we are before you in our guilt, for no one can stand before you because of this. Ezra prays for God to be merciful to his people. He prays for God. He prays to God and begs for forgiveness, eventually leading the people to repent for their sin. Does anybody know the best part about this story? Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's the fact that Ezra's not guilty. Ezra didn't do it. He prayed on the behalf of the people as if the sin that they committed was his. He had an understanding that when his flock was in rebellion against God, he was too if he was not able to rebuke them or if he was not able to pray for them and eventually lead them into repentance. We, we do not do this. Our passage, in a very similar way, Moses falls down before the Lord with humility and begs for mercy on behalf of the people of Israel. Even though they are rebelling against him and ultimately against the Lord, Moses still asks God to have mercy on his flock. We need more men and women of God that are willing to pray and do this for others. And God mercifully, mercifully grants the request of Moses, even though the entire congregation is in rebellion against God. God has mercy on them by telling them in verse 26, depart now from the tents of these wicked men and touch nothing that belongs to them or you will be swept away in their sin. Giving them an opportunity to escape the judgment that he was going to exact against the leaders of this rebellion. And it appears they took this opportunity. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and all they owned were swallowed up by the ground and sent directly to Sheol for their roles in inciting this rebellion against God. Then God rained fire from the heavens and utterly destroyed the 250 men who were offering incense because these men were not priests. God had once again showed Israel that he was God and he was to be obeyed. obeyed. I'll close with this. Even after seeing all of these miraculous things, seeing fire come down from heaven, seeing the ground open up, the people of Israel still complained daily. They were spared from these judgments and they still complained again. They blame Moses and Aaron all over again. We didn't originally read this in the beginning, but look at verse 41 of this chapter, 16. But on the next day, the next day, the congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. They were just spared from judgment because of their rebellion, and they did it again the next day. Imagine seeing the ground open up, fire fall from the sky, burn a bunch of people up and you still grumble against God. Sounds crazy, right? Sounds insane. Imagine being given life, breath, family, a purpose, unnecessary comforts, and oh, salvation. Salvation from sin and still complain about our daily lives. See, the one thing that I hope that you understand from this morning is that if you have listened to this sermon and have a right understanding of the word of God, that you realize that in a way, my heart 
your heart, our hearts are just like Korah's. We think we can define the worship of God, and for some reason we don't understand that when we complain, we are in rebellion against God. And if we have a right understanding, we have to know that we are just like Korah. And we are guilty of the same sin of him, as him. Thus worthy of the exact same punishment. But remember that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, to come and live a perfect life and bear the weight and punishment for the sin that you and I deserve. Why? Because he loves us. You and I have some pretty high callings. I work every day. I'm studying at the University of Toledo. We have responsibilities, but without Christ, all of these things mean nothing. Everything we do as mothers, fathers, sons, daughters, employees, neighbors, should reflect the love of Christ. And worshiping God rightly and not complaining about our daily lives is just a step in the right direction. And if you are here today and you do not know that love of Christ, please, 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 I am begging you, please come talk to me, come find me, or find somebody else to talk to. We have pastors on staff after the service. Every step we take in our Christian walk should point towards Christ's perfect life and to his sacrificial death on the cross of Calvary. To the power and majesty of him redeeming us with his resurrection. I do not always think nor act this way. We do not always think or act this way. We need Christ. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Let's pray.